um, presenting. Okay, great. Um, and please tell me to slow down if I'm talking too fast. I, I do have a bad habit of doing that. But <laughs> You'll end me both, friend. You'll end me. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be slow. Um, okay. Um, so we have a 37-year-old male with no significant past medical history, um, and the chief complaint is shortness of breath. Do you want me to keep going? Or just yeah, talk? do you want to give us a little bit more information? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, okay. And so I apologize. The order of this is a little different because he ended up being transferred to our hospital. Um, so I'm going to start with everything that happened before he got there and um, we'll kind of go from there. So um, 12 days before he was transferred to us, um, he was seen in the emergency room for five days of shortness of breath, palpitations. Um, his heart rate when he got there was in the 80s, blood pressure 118 over 77, um, afebrile. He was found to have frequent PVCs. Um, with episodes of bigeminy, but the EKG was non-ischemic. His troponin was negative. Um, his D-dimer was slightly elevated at 511, with the upper limit of normal being 250, but a CTA chest was negative for a PE. Um, and labs were noticeable for a hemoglobin of 10.9 without any known baseline, um, a TSH of 8, but a normal free and total T4, and he was discharged with cardiology follow-up. All right. Thank you so much, Megan. What a rich start uh, to the case. So it sounds like we have a 37-year-old man with no significant past medical history who was presenting with about 12 days of shortness of breath, if I uh, caught that uh, correctly. And it was evaluated uh, uh, for that. It sounds like he had like some PVCs. Um, CTA was negative for any PEs uh, with... Uh, low T TSH, but normal T4. And uh, he was like discharged with a cardiology follow-up. So uh, when I'm thinking about, you know, shortness of breath in this context, and, you know, I like how even you can see from their evaluation, they were really anchoring themselves also in their no misdiagnosis. So thinking about ACS, thinking about pulmonary embolism, um, are the two things that it's been ruled out. Um, you know, we time and time again, um, we think about like whenever we think about a dyspnea and shortness of breath, we often think about a, a cardiac and pulmonary causes as um, the uh, as the buckets that we want to evaluate uh, first. He wasn't hypoxemic, so we can't further narrow that down to hypoxemia. Uh, you know, she has like a little bit of an anemia, but again, like in some like a healthy, otherwise healthy individual, I don't anticipate people being short of breath with just anemia to about tens. And the PVCs are quite interesting. So thinking about, is there a relation between the frequency of the PVCs that this um, a patient has and um, uh, and uh, the shortness of breath, um, thinking about like arrhythmia burden. And with PVCs, I often think about like whether they're like ischemia driven, are there any reasons for dysarrhythmias, like electrolyte imbalances, any structural abnormalities of the heart? You know, sometimes with infiltrative diseases, people tend to have a bit more uh, arrhythmia, dysarrhythmias in general. And the more PVC burden that a person has, the more dysarrhythmia people have, people are at higher risk of uh, the developing um, a heart failure uh, and sequ sequela of that. But, you know, with the CTA being negative, it, uh, it gives you a good view of the parenchyma as well. So um, again, like we, there's no report of like any pulmonary edema, any like parenchymal involvement that would uh, make us think about any pulmonary uh, causes. So I'm curious to learn more about, uh, and the only signal we're getting here is the PVCs and the surgery. So thinking about um, is that the etiology of the shortness of breath or we're missing something um, it would be kind of how I'm approaching this patient. Um, all right. Um, and let's, I think Jack might be here. Um, so uh, yeah, Megan, do you want to give us a little bit more information? Yeah, definitely. Um, so three days after this initial presentation, um, he had worsening dyspnea, insomnia. He said his symptoms were worse when he was lying down, nausea, vomiting with a dry cough. 
Um, came back to the ED at that point. His vitals, again, were all within normal limits. Um, wasn't having any fevers or chills at home. No URI symptoms. Um, and his labs this time were notable for a sodium of 133, but an otherwise normal BMP. Um, on his hepatic panel, his albumin was 3.2. T-Billy was 1.8. elk Foss was 138. AST 792. ALT 1028. Um, his CBC was stable. Acute hepatitis and Tylenol levels were negative. RVP was negative. HIV negative. His BNP was 855, with the upper limit of normal being about 100. Um, troponin was negative times two, and urine drug screen was negative. Um, and then just going into a little bit of his past medical history and social history, like I said, no past medical history, takes no daily medications, has no significant family history. Um, social, he drinks one to two times a week, no tobacco use, no other substance use. Um, moved to Colorado from Florida a few months ago and living in an apartment with a friend, works in software design, um, and no significant exposures or allergies, and no recent illness or immunizations. All right. Yeah, this case is getting uh, richer and richer. Uh, so now uh, we have a bit more data. And in terms of um, going through the data uh, systematically, uh, I'm so glad the patient came back. Um, and, uh, you know, the fevers and chills of being absent and no right symptoms, kind of like alluding to making an infectious or inflammatory etiology maybe a little less uh, likely. Uh, and I think, you know, the one thing that I'm sure captured everybody's attention is the elevated liver chemistries uh, panel. Um, with again, with the elevated liver chemistry panels, one of the first things you always want to rule out would be acute hepatitis, and the hepatologies here are negative. Um, so the question now becomes like, is you know the liver ideal if the liver abnormalities. Uh, the primary driver or a consequences of uh, whatever uh, underlying etiology is causing his shortness of breath. So if you're thinking about like the car, the heart and the liver and how do they relate, especially in a setting of an elevated BMP and with the high, higher burden of PVC, are we dealing with like a heart failure with some congestive hepatopathy as a result um, of that? And uh, is that kind of the picture that is being painted? Um, you know, this is a good time. Uh, if I am not very good with focus, but uh, uh, taking a look at the heart or like getting a formal TT, I think would be really, really helpful. In terms of like, you know, uh, LFTs being abnormal, I, I would, if I'm taking care of this patient in real life, I would do uh, both at the same time, thinking about like investigating the cardiac and uh, investigating the liver separately. So getting a liver uh, ultrasound to uh, get a better sense of the parenchyma with Doppler to make sure there's no vascular pathologies uh, involved. And within the parenchyma, uh, like a med side effects, toxins are the one he drinks, but not really... Um, uh, occasionally. So again, thinking this being related to alcohol makes it a little less likely. Thinking about Tylenol, thinking about the hip serologies as they have done. Um, and and getting further imaging to see if there is um, anything else that is uh, going on. Um, and, you know, with people who have a good reserve, if you kind of take a step back and this patient has normal vital signs, uh, we want to make sure that um, this patient, uh, and because younger people tend to have better reserve, anytime I see, I worry about cardiac and liver abnormality, uh, my no misdiagnosis is ruling out heart being the main driver of that. I'm making sure, you know, this patient is hemodynamically stable, getting a lactate to make sure this patient is not tiptoeing into a cardiogenic shock, especially if you have no better reason to um, explain the liver abnormalities. Um, would be another thing that I would like, I'm worried about this patient and, and I want to keep a very close eye um, as well. Um, in terms of like uh, the other heart related uh, behaviors um, and allergies, just to make sure I didn't miss anything, nothing that really jumps out uh, to me yet. So I'm curious to see what the exam uh, shows. All right. Um, I have one more eloquent before 
um, we get into the exam, but they repeated some imaging, um, a CTA chest still without PE. Um, they also imaged the abdomen and pelvis with CT. They noted mild cardiac enlargement with a 1.8 centimeter LV thrombus, enhancement powder of the liver suggesting hepatic congestion. Um, and then followed that up with an echo, which showed an EF of 35 to 40% with inferolateral wall hypokinesis, chronic appearing LV thrombus, the right ventricle is enlarged, but with grossly appearing function, mild mitral regurg, and no other valvular abnormalities. And at this point, he was admitted to the hospital for further management. All right. Oh, boy, I'm not happy about the LV thrombus. Um, so, uh, you know, I think our suspicion for this uh, may, may be car uh, being driven by the you know, by cardiac pathology has gone up a bit, uh, given the CT imaging finding and the cardiac finding. When I think about when I see an LV thrombus, um, I think about, you know, someone who has um very reduced um, ejection fraction or like a lot of dysfunction within the ventricle that the causing a lot of stasis. Um, um, and then also thinking about like other arrhythmias like AFib that we often uh, see that with. And there are uh, also the last thing I also think about about conditions that can cause more um, a thrombosis. So thinking about like hypercoagulable states and sometimes, you know, with cardiac dysfunctions, like I believe like eosinophilic myocarditis type um, pictures, you often can have increased uh, hypercoagulability. Um, the trip was normal. Uh, oftentimes myocarditis does present with uh, elevated troponin and non-ischemic myocardial injury. So um, I think a couple of things to make sure uh, in this patient is uh, definitely I would love to see uh, a TTE uh, to better characterize um, the car. Oh, so we do have it. Sorry, I just completely missed that. <laughs> it kind of tells you like sometimes in real life you like miss data that is presented. So uh, yeah, so the ejection fraction is a uh, low at the 35 for 40%. So thinking about now what is causing um, uh, a decreased uh, function, uh, cardiac function. And when I think about that, you know, in all comers in the US, for example, things that are common, things being common are ischemic cardiomyopathy is quite young um, uh, to have ischemia. Um, uh, so thinking about um, a non-ischemic uh, car like cardiomyopathies as well. So thinking about, you know, we know he has had this burdens of PVC, is this like arrhythmia induced um, uh, cardiomyopathy, is there something wrong with the myocardium? Thinking about, as I mentioned, like the toxins, the TSH the, um, was normal, like metabolic ideologies, and then thinking about uh, uh, like congenital structural abnormalities in the past, and then uh, um, would be the other thing to think about. Um, so uh, I think in real life, what I would do just to make sure um, uh, based on the exam to thinking about uh, and labs, like, uh, am I dealing with like someone who's like cardiogenic shock or just here for heart failure exacerbation and new diagnosis of that? And thinking about what would be the next step in uh, the management. Uh, uh, right now, uh, just to explicitly state it out loud, I am contributing all the liver stuff to the heart and congestive uh, 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 congestive um, hepatopathy. However, we might down the road need to separate that again. But I think for now, the heart remains the issue. All right. Um, so for the next aliquot, um, the patient was admitted, was started on GDMT with um, a SGLT2 and ARB, a beta blocker, um, and then also given IV diuresis. Um, he got a coronary angiography, which showed normal coronary vessels, and a cardiac MRI that showed a severely dilated LV with normal wall thickness, global hypokinesis with an estimated EF of 24% um, for the left ventricle and a right ventricular EF of about 23%, um, a non-ischemic pattern with diffuse subendocardial late gadolinium enhancement of the lateral wall and septum. Um, and on the day prior to admission or prior to transfer um, to our facility, he went into sinus arrest um, with a junctional escape rhythm in the 40s, became hypotensive to 78s over 60s. Um, they placed an active fixation temp, um, temp wire and started him on levofed. His creatinine went to 2.6 from 0.9. His lactate went to 4.6 from normal. 
um, and he was transferred to our hospitals, to our hospital um, for further evaluation. Um, so if you want to just comment on that, and then um, if you're the resident or the intern who's kind of accepting this patient, just what your framework is for um, kind of thinking about next steps and how you should manage someone who's this sick. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. Yeah, happy to just to make sure I captured all the information correctly. So it sounds like, you know, started uh, on some uh, medication for heart failure management, went into sinus arrest, and that led to kind of worsening of his symptoms. Now he's coming in with worsening AKI. And was that a uh, normal lactate or elevated lactate? Lactate was elevated at 4.6 and was previously normal when he was admitted. Uh, all right. So, um, you know, uh, I think like, uh, again, I command this, um, whoever was taking care of this patient, I trying to get this patient on medications to uh, improve uh, his heart failure. Um, however, I think like one thing to also realize is like the ideology of why this patient is in heart failure and thinking about, you know, uh, the dilated cardiomyopathy, um, you know, given his young age, um, and thinking about like if there is any congenital or like idiopathic form of a cardiomyopathy uh, that we are missing uh, given the dilated fashion of it. I wish I could tell you I am as good with cardiac MRI that I could tell you what that late uh, getting of enhancement it is, but I would say uh, just from like pattern recognition, if a patient is having a lot of arrhythmias and they have like uh, some uh, enhancement, uh, Oftentimes from pattern one, like sarcoid comes to mind. However, uh, I would say like it tends to be more restrictive than dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, so that is something that, again, like I just need help from cardiology to better estimate that. Are we dealing with like any infiltrative ideologies that has led to uh, that um, or is the patient? Um, so, yeah, so I think definitely I would need cardiology's help uh, with a better understanding of like, what is that? I wonder about like, you know, hereditary or congenital issues uh, in this patient that is quite young. So, and especially like going to sinus arrest, I'm thinking about whatever is happening is affecting this patient's conduction system. And thinking about diseases that affect the conduction system is like one way I would think about it. Whether, you know, the addition of a beta blocker was what, um, led to this um, a decompensation, possible. However, I think like whatever it's happening here uh, is um, sexually related to the underlying disease this patient is having. So one thing that I would like to do is like kind of thinking about like the bradycardia and the sinus pause separately and think about are there any uh, ideologies that is leading to the bradycardia um, as well. And when I think about like bradycardia, I think about like primary causes and secondary causes. Um, like the primary causes are oftentimes like the things that we do to patient. If this patient had a tower, for example, did they have any, any under, did they have ischemia that led to um, a sinus arrest, uh, for example? Um, or are there like secondary causes like from like metabolic derangements to um, infections that can lead to um, you know, that lead to uh, bradycardia. Um, and uh, with this patient now coming in with um, a sinus arrest, so what I'm worried about in this patient is cardiogenic shock, right? The patient has elevated lactate and the blood pressure is in the 70s over 60s. One thing that is like really helpful when you're worried about a, a cardiogenic shock is looking at that blood pressure. That narrow pulse pressure is... Uh, it makes you really worried about cardiogenic shock and this patient is having evidence of end organ damage in lactate, elevated lactate and um, uh, AKI. So uh, getting uh, so getting your friend, a cardiologist on board, uh, thinking about uh, uh, ionotropy in this patient, uh, thinking about if there are any evidence of volume overload, uh, diuresing this patient and after load reduction, you know, the patient is in the 70s or 60s. So doesn't need any more after load reduction, but I do wonder if he needs like a little bit more ionotropy uh, in this case. Um, and uh, monitoring this patient, like making sure you have your uh, A lines in place, um, uh, making sure um, to trend labs is what I would do. And thinking about like, you know, in addition to the uh, cardio uh, in, in ionotropy, they need uh, any other uh, pressors on board as well is how I'm thinking about it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, 
So when he arrived at our hospital, um, he actually looked great compared to what you would expect based on the labs and based on kind of the story that I was just giving, which I think is definitely a, a testament to how well younger people can compensate with everything going on. Um, his mucous membranes were moist. His extremities were warm. Um, he really didn't have any peripheral edema. His heart was paced at 90 because he had that pace, the temp pacemaker placed, um, had a soft systolic murmur, but his lungs were clear. He really didn't have any JVD. Um, and his abdomen was soft, non-tender, non-distended. Um, labs that we got when he arrived, um, his CBC, no leukocytosis, his hemoglobin was stable in the tens, platelets were 381. Um, on his BMP, his sodium was now 127, the normal potassium and a normal bicarb. Um, his creatinine is 2.06 from a baseline of 0.8. Um, a BUN of 44. And then on his hepatic panel, his AST um, is now 1,115, ALT 823, um, with a normal ALK FOS and a normal BILI. Um, and since being treated with the um, Lebofed, his lactate was now 1.4. Um, other tests that we ordered, we repeated the viral hepatitis panel. We sent an HIV, both of those were negative. Um, and then we got an SPEP with immunofixation that did not show any monoclonal process. Um, we had the same thoughts as you in terms of whether or not he needed more inotropy. Um, so we ended up switching him to dobutamine. Um, and he actually had good pressures with systolics in like the 90s to 100s over 60s. But later that day, um, had two episodes of PVC initiated polymorphic ventricular, or sorry, mon monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, um, requiring defibrillation, and ultimately was intubated and sedated um, for VT storm. Um, we woke him up the following day, and he was mentating appropriately and was actually able to be extubated um, once he was loaded with amiodarone. Um, and continue to have PVCs, but no further VT. Um, but his kidney injury was worsening, his urine output dropped, and his lactate then jumped to eight from 2.9. Oof. Wow. Um uh, I this is a lot. And I'm so glad he had all of you to take care of him and think so uh so much about what is uh happening. So uh quite unfortunate. Um, so sounds like, you know, with initial management of cardiogenic he started to improve and then had another um, uh, with PVC and the VT that led into a VT storm that caused the worsening of his uh, symptoms. Um, so if I have to take a step back and say like, okay, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? This is a young gentleman, like younger younger gentleman than the usual population that comes into my hospital uh, without any significant past medical history that is presenting with kind of rapidly progressive worsening um, a dilated cardiomyopathy with a significant dysarrhythmia um, that has led into cardiogenic um, shock. Um, so um, in the, within like kind of like that framing, I really uh, thinking about like, I really love that people mm -hmm. thought about like SPF and UPAS, so thinking about amyloid that can be infiltrated. There are a few diseases that um, I think like familial um, diseases that cause a, a fibrosis at a younger age. Um, and I worry with like thinking about the dilated cardiomyopathy with addition of um, the dysarrhythmia on top of that and the VT, does this patient have scars and um, fibrosis uh, um, and that has led to the cardio dilated cardiomyopathy in addition to the uh, uh, to the VT storm. Uh, again, within like the electrolytes, we, uh, we often think about that nothing is like really jumping out. We know he probably uh, uh, less likely for it to be like ischemia driven. So I think what I would do is like talking to cardiology and EP and also like thinking about um, I like, um, I'm thinking about one of these, um, uh, hereditary diseases or congenital diseases. So the other thing to think about, you know, I, I think about like in potential, like from my perspective, like infectious ideologies that could present with that, you know, when we think about like sinus issues, like Lyme comes to mind. However, I've never heard like the this VT or dilated cardiomyopathy associated uh, with it um, either. And um, um, so the, the other one that again, like 
I, I wouldn't expect a 37 year old uh, that it, uh, has potentially lived in Colorado, but like Chagas disease, I think worldwide is one disease that, that definitely caused significant dysarrhythmias and dilated cardiomyopathy. So thinking about, is there any risk factor for like Chagas cardiomyopathy uh, for him? Um, and, and in terms of like, you know, um, uh, autoimmune and malignancy bucket, um, malignancy definitely less likely in the autoimmune uh, uh, ideologies. I've the number of times I've been humbled with lupus. However, again, the presentation doesn't quite seem consistent uh, for uh, for that. So I think that's what I would be doing, thinking about uh, like congenital issues in addition to uh, thinking about any other infections and specifically like Chagas that I might be missing. But um uh, uh, yeah, and I think initially um, I thought about like more infiltrative uh, diseases um, like amyloid sarco. Uh, we like I don't want to spoil the WDX episode that we just published, but that was an incredible case that turned out to be like a myocarditis actually with normal troponin. Um, so that really really humbles me. Uh, Again, like dilated cardiomyopathy with someone like giant cell myocarditis uh, tends to uh, happens. Uh, uh, in general, like it's like giant myocarditis, I believe it's like a less hypogenic that's something like sarcoid. However, how rapidly this pr progresses makes sarcoid a little less likely in my mind. So I am completely humbled and puzzled as to what is going on, Megan. What did you guys do next? Okay, perfect. Um, I have one more aliquot and then I'll reveal the final diagnosis. Um, but yeah, our team was kind of stumped in the same place as you. And I was on the advanced heart failure service taking care of this patient. Um, so I had the support of all the cardiologists who take care of patients who are this ill um, all the time. And it definitely is humbling. Um, and so I think at this point, our dilemma was kind of two things like, A, we really want to figure out what the diagnosis is. But also, regardless of what the diagnosis is, is this a recoverable process? And what are we going to do to support this patient um, with how sick he is? Because, you know, for cardiogenic shock, you have things like inotropes and you can do afterload reduction and you can try all these things. But with all of his VT, um, we're really limited by the amount of dobutamine that um, we can put him on. Um, and then with all the mechanical support devices that we can offer sometimes, like a balloon pump and impella, um, the impella was contraindicated with this LV thrombus, um, the balloon pump, um, we didn't really think was going to give him the amount of support that he needed. Um, and so we actually ended up, um, calling the surgery team to cannulate this patient for VA ECMO, um, and decided that this was most likely not a recoverable, um, cardiac injury, just given the extent of his shock and, um, all of his kind of conduction abnormalities that we were seeing. Um, and so he, and right after we ended up um, getting him cannulated on ECMO, he actually went back into sustained monomorphic VT um, and was cardioverted for it. And so um, it was reassuring to us that I think we made the right decision um, with the VA ECMO. And um, luckily we're a transplant center, um, a heart transplant center at the University of Colorado. So he was listed that day um, as status one for a heart transplant plan and ended up getting one six days later. Um, and the final diagnosis was made um, via biopsy after um, they took out his heart. So Wow. Tell you what it is or what you. Oh, yeah. Let <laughs> us participate. And I would appreciate anyone in the chat also helping me out and thinking what this could be. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for sharing this case. And I'm so, so, so grateful that this patient was uh, able to get a heart transplant and hopefully is doing okay now. Uh, I think um, if I have to like kind of take a step back and thinking about the degree of the heart failure, I worry about like, to be honest, I know it's a diagnosis of exclusion, but like a genetic a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, there's a condition that I, f I forget the name of it that has fibrosis in addition to dilated cardiomyopathy as the presentation. If anybody knows it, please uh, say so. Um, uh, but uh, the one thing that, um, uh, so I think that would be high on my differential. And then, you know, I'm always been humbled by like infiltrative processes. Again, the dilation is throwing me off. Uh, so I'm sure there's like a gap in uh, my knowledge about that too. And 
Um, so those are the two things that I would be thinking the most about, especially in the setting of like arrhythmia plus the dilated cardiomyopathy. While saying that, I just want to preface that like whenever you have extreme dilations of the heart or the heart is so weak, you are going to be more prone into arrhythmias. But his degree of like VT storms and PVCs from the get go kind of signals to me that even before him getting worse, this was a, a part of the disease presentation. But I cannot wait to learn from you, Megan. Um, I'm so curious. Yeah, and our team had all the same thoughts, um, and the biopsy ended up showing lymphocytic myocarditis, um, which typically you see, yeah, post-viral, post-immunization. Um, so it was a really kind of atypical presentation just because um, I think you've mentioned this before about a troponin-negative myocarditis, um, but it was something I'd never seen or heard of before um, and was definitely a big um, knowledge gap for me. Um, and I think just I have some teaching points that I can go over unless you want to um, comment on the final diagnosis first. You know, I this is my second time getting humbled <laughs> by uh, tro uh, troponin negative myocarditis. And I think it kind of shows you about how, especially with these rare uh, diseases, again, uh, like giant cell lymphocytic are not very common. So the atypical presentation of rare diseases are quite challenging. And with like lymphocytic um, myocarditis specifically, like the dilation was uh, like very odd to, to me as well. And as you mentioned, my association is also like viral drugs um, and it was, uh, uh, yeah, viral and infectious being a big category. So uh yeah, this is incredibly humbling. I learned so much uh, from this case, but yeah, I would love to learn from uh, you, Megan. Yeah. Um, so I can just kind of go over briefly how just how I framed all of this and what I um, kind of made a point to read over and teach myself after um, I learned it. But I think just like thinking about cardiomyopathy broadly. Um, I like to think of it as being dilated, hypertrophic, or restrictive. Um, and since this one we knew was dilated, I'll talk most specifically about that. Um, I think the first branch point that can be helpful is deciding if this is ischemic or non-ischemic. Um, and so getting a coronary angiography pretty early on um, is something that I think is usually done even sometimes in patients that don't really have any risk factors for ischemia, like this person, just because you want to make sure that it's not something that you're missing. Um, and if it's ischemic cardiology that's causing someone to have this degree of heart failure and cardiogenic shock, it's not just going to be like a single circumflex lesion. They're going to have really bad triple vessel disease. Um, so even if you find a little something, just being cognizant and cautious to not attribute all of the heart failure um, to like a single lesion that you would find. Um, and then I think that within like the non-ischemic um, category, you can think of it as being like inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. Um, and so the non-inflammatory stuff is mostly going to be like genetic and arrhythmia induced. Um, and this is where the MRI can be helpful. You can see that late gadolinium enhancement that suggests, suggests more of an um, inflammatory process that's going on, especially if it's not in a coronary distribution. Um, that's pretty pathognomonic for myocarditis. Um, and then thinking about kind of all the different things that can cause it. Um, so viruses being very common. Um, we see it with adeno, parvo, enterovirus, HHV. Um, but really, I think there's been case reports of many different bugs doing it, bacteria, fungi. Um, so a low threshold, I think, to kind of do an extensive um, infectious evaluation. Um, but that being said, it's often really hard to diagnose the viral types just because a lot of times the PCRs are negative. Um, and so you kind of end up in this like idiopathic, maybe, maybe viral category where you're not entirely sure um, if that was the reason. But you've eliminated some of the other things you want, always want to look for like the toxins. So cocaine is a big one that we see alcohol, also another big one. Um, and then some of like the chemotherapy agents are known to do it. Um, and then other systemic diseases, you can see vasculitis, autoimmune diseases, um, and then just also in like the post-infectious period. Um, and then kind of another subcategory, I think within um, all of this, that's really relevant for this patient is fulminant myocarditis. Um, and that's not necessarily a diagnosis. It just um, basically defines someone who has this really bad new onset, severe heart failure and cardiogenic shock um, requiring IV, IV inotropes. Um, and 
the things that you want to think about when you see this, because most patients who have myocarditis um, do get better on their own. Um, and so it's a lot of supportive care. But for these patients who get so sick and decompensate so quickly, um, you want to think about giant cell, eosinophilic myocarditis, sarcoid, and then the viral idiopathic lymphocytic myocarditis can do it too. Um, and someone had brought up steroids in the chat, which I think is a really good point and also something that we had discussed. Um, we actually ended up giving steroids as soon as he got there, even without knowing the diagnosis, just because um, he was having all these conduction system abnormalities, had this fulminant myocarditis, and we decided that the risk or the benefit of treating with steroids probably outweighed the risk. Um, so even despite that, he ended up further decompensating and, and needing a transplant. Um, but yeah, and kind of actually getting the biopsy and um, making the diagnosis is important too, because long-term management um, can be different based on if it's sarco sarcoid or giant cell. Um, those patients typically go on to require long-term steroids um, versus some of the other etiologies might not necessarily need it. Um, but there is still, there's not a lot of, a lot of the um, different types of myocarditis, there isn't a ton of evidence-based evidence, evidence -based kind of like long-term management. Um, and so a lot of times it's kind of left up to the discretion of the provider, but um, I think that was all I had. So it was a really good learning case and um, a really sick patient that ended up doing well post-transplant. Um, I still look at his chart and um, he's been following up regularly and um, is overall doing well. So, Wow. Wow. Incredible teaching points, Megan. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, I am floored and thank you so much for presenting this. And yeah, and I think like framing this uh, as kind of the formulant uh, heart failure, uh, it's a good way of thinking about it to make sure not missing myocarditis. And I think this is the second time this is uh, in the past few weeks uh, that uh, I'm taking away is that like, you know, especially like atypical presentations are challenging. So uh, making sure we're framing this correctly to consider. And yeah, and I, I agree with like, kind of thinking about like giant cell. Um, and whenever you think about giant cell is like, is it a feel like, like again, steroid diseases have a really high mortality and morbidity associated with them, even when you give steroids. So I think the best thing that could have ever happened for this patient was the transplant. And I'm so, so grateful he got it and he's doing well. Um, I thank you so much for sharing this, uh, the story, the case with us. I learned so much and I have so much to reflect on, uh, yeah, both sarcoid and lymphocytic ones are not on my differential for like fulminant type uh, uh, type uh, heart failure. So it's, this is a very good learning for me to make sure to consider it. Gosh, I can think about this case and talk about it forever. But thank you so much, Megan. Uh, shout out to Kimon for expertly uh, Skyping. And Julia, I cannot wait to hear your teaching points. So <clears throat> thank you so much, everyone. I had a lot of fun following this, your discussions and there were so many great thoughts. So thank you so much for the discussion and Megan for the beautiful presenting, uh, beautifully presenting this case. So I'd briefly like to sum it up. So we have a 37 year male with like no notable past medical history who presents with a chief complaint of shortness of breath and palpitations. And we first first thought about shortness of breath and um, even that we definitely have to exclude the most morbid and common etiologies before we think about um, less common um, etiologies. So primary, the uh, pulmonary and cardiac causes. And in when we have a young patient with arrhythmias, we should uh, keep infiltrated diseases in mind. In this patient, we also noted liver abnormalities and to approach liver abnormalities, we, we uh, first wanted to separate primary liver diseases with like the viral hep hepatitis panel, for example, from uh, secondary causes, primary like congestive heart failure. Um, the LV thrombus, thrombus which we, was seen in we, we should think about etiologies like a very low ejection fraction, stasis in the ventricle, AFib, eosinophilic myocarditis, and also a hypercoagulable state of the patient. 
when we approach the symptom of bradycardia, we separate that also in primary and secondary, uh, which can help us to like further evaluate on it. Um, we also learned about cardiomyopathies, which are divided in three big buckets. So we have dilative, hypertrophic, and restrictive cardiomyopathies. We should first um, exclude ischemic causes and then think about the non-ischemic ones. Um, also, we've learned that the MRI can help us to differentiate inflammatory from non-inflammatory cardiomyopathies. Quite typical is the late gadolinium enhancement. In a young patient with um, heart failure, the likelihood for any congenital causes or infiltrative diseases uh, is, is much higher, but still we should think about infections, most typically like Chagas disease. Um, we have, in this case, what was very untypical is that um, we've, we usually collect my, myocarditis and, tropon and elevated troponin serum levels, but we cannot exclude a myocarditis when we have a negative tro troponin levels. And lastly, we learned that um, there are some crucial causes for fulminant myocarditis, so having a myocarditis. Um, cardiomyopathy with that requires um, IV inotropes, and then we should um, soon approach biopsy to exclude like giant cell myocarditis, eosinophilic, sarcoid, or viral lymphocytic like, myopathies. Cardiomyopathies. Thank you. <laughs> Julia, that was awesome. Uh this is Julia's first time doing Teaching Point, and thank you so much for doing such a fabulous job. And this case was just so rich. Uh, really, really appreciate you all. Thanks again, Megan, for that incredible case and also the amazing Teaching Points. Uh, yeah, I'm going to remember this and reflect on this for a while. I appreciate it. Have a good one, you all. Thanks so much.